So what I'll do, I think there are mics um, going around. Uh, I'll take questions and we'll then proceed to, uh, to have coffee and something to eat. So who'd like to ask the first question? Have a question here. Thank you very much. You mentioned too many mergers. Would you stretch that to what was done in the 80s with education and uh, the hospitals? In what, in what respect? Well, they were, all, they were merged. The major universities and, and uh, hospitals were, were merged. I, I think it's an interesting question. I think that, yes, I think that mergers in the public sector have also delocalised our society and taken people away from what they own. I think that's certainly true. And what I think we need to do is stop thinking about hierarchical merger for the sake of efficiency and think about merging with citizens, merging with the people themselves, so that the shape of our state infrastructure stops reflecting how it should look on charts in Whitehall and start reflecting what people need at the bottom. Indeed. Second question. In the front. Sorry, Nicholas in the front. Thank you, Philip. Um, it's a great pleasure to hear a speech with which I agreed uh, absolutely. Uh, but um, use banking as, a, as an example of the perverse effects of a kind of um, liberal understanding of the market. Perhaps you might say something about supermarkets, which are, for my money, an even worse example, in that they do all the things banks do, but they also have a highly detrimental effect on the, uh, on the townscapes and cityscapes, which... Uh, are themselves a critical part of uh, developing a sense of shared belonging of the kind you described? I, th I concur. I think 74% um, of our food retail market is now controlled by the big four. And what's interesting about monopoly is that actually it's often subsidised by the state and is in some sense state engendered. And that we covertly, whether we realise it or not, subsidise a monopolised model. Car parking for supermarkets is an interesting phenomenon. In that regard, it's not subject to a separate rateable value. It prices in people because if you actually try and park in town centres, the local kind of just Gestapo are always trying to fine you for like £300 or something. So you get too terrified by that and you end up parking in the supermarket. And then, in essence, you are uh, convenience speaks and you shop there. I think, though, that the key point is to create new models. The, the issue isn't to be anti-big business. It, the issue is to bind big business into reciprocal relationships in the community because I think there are ways in which supermarkets could operate differently and create local markets. Asda is doing it in part and in, small, in a small way and, a, and I think other providers are trying to do that. But I would like to see supermarkets localised. I would like to see a proportion of their area having to go to local suppliers. I would like to see the development of local hubs lo that supply food to the supermarkets. And I would like to see the breakup of the monopoly price provision that supermarkets can enforce on suppliers. I would also, as a Democrat, like to give local um, towns the ability to veto a supermarket in their area if they felt it was too damaging. I mean, why on earth not? So I think that... Um, the point would be is this is one of the more visible examples of monopoly in our lives and uh, one of the more telling ways in which we can reintroduce democratic diversity in our landscapes, be they retail, uh, environmental um, or finance, and produce a society that works for all. Next question, please. Sorry, we have one right in the front. Okay, I was pleased that you quoted Burke there, and I think I'd like to another quote from Burke, which is in the same vein, where he says, a true politician must have a heart full of sensibility. He must fear himself and love mankind, which a lot of politicians probably don't do at the moment, I might say. Yeah. Do you think that it could be a way of reinstilling that sort of Burkean approach to politics uh, through civic <laughs> conservatism, or would it be necessary, or does it go along with, uh, introduction of, uh, of democratic mechanisms such as the recall and referendums and things like that? I think, I think one of the problems we have is so many people have so little power that they're sort of raging at the door and they think that everybody inside is corrupt because they've never had any power themselves. And I think that's part of the problem. But if you give people back power, they understand, I think, that power is difficult, that suddenly you've got interest groups that you've got to balance and suddenly you learn that the people 
as it were, who are in a certain in political authority aren't evil, they're often trying to do their best. And I think that we really need a re restoration of public virtue, and that's not meant to be some sort of awful repressive moral category. It's meant to be the notion of the public good. And many politicians want to serve the public good, and we need to recognise that. And if we start thinking all our, politics are, uh, all our politics and all our politicians are criminal, we diminish ourselves and we make ourselves less powerful. So I think that's key. I think Sunder had a question. Thanks, yeah. Philip. Sunder Catwalloff from Fabian Society. It seems to me a, a quite likely outcome is that modern conservative politicians might think, I like this associative language, this strong society language. That's great. But this um, red Tory economics, breaking up Tesco, localism, protectionism, that's strong stuff. I won't use that. For you, does it, does it have to come together as, as a piece? And if, 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 if you don't do that, do you, do you lack, in a sense, an account of the 1980s and why the market trumped society? Do, do, does your economic argument have to be taken up if your social bonds argument is to, is to mean something substantive? Yeah, um, I think the short answer to that is yes. Uh, I think you're right, Sunder. I think that we need a political economy to deliver on localism. Uh, I've never shied away from talking about Thatcherism. I'm strongly, I support her in some ways, have reservations in the other way. I'm not frightened of talking about our history. Um, but I basically agree with you. We do need that, that radical, um, localised political economy. What we need to do, though, is sort of kind of look at the macro economy. Because if you look at international capital, what is the role of the sovereign British tax base? The role of the sovereign British tax base is it underwrites international capital and so misprices capital. And because it misprices capital, investment, investment finance gets a free ride or gets a lower price. And that prices out the local economy. The key task to revaluing sort of our microeconomy is revaluing our macroeconomy so that rates of return can rise in localities. And I think this is part of the key intensification of our, of our industries. If we can get local economies to generate the productivity gains that I think are possible through association, then um, local economies really can deliver the step change that Britain needs. Whereas at the moment, our economy is as centralised as our state around a model that's now, I think, broken. I'll take a couple more and then I'll, I'll end. We have, we have um, sorry, one there from the lady there. Thank you very much. Um, Joanne Green from CAFOD. Um, I was really interested in what you were saying, Philip, about um, possibly not needing regulation for yeah. business. And I was wondering if you'd think applying that to the context of overseas development and the role of business in developing countries and how that would work in that case um, to make sure that business actually has a positive impact in developing countries' business that is based here. Wouldn't we need regulation for that? <laughs> Well, I think, I mean, again, the point is, is I, th if I think part of me sort of recognises the power of big business. And I think that if big business can be tied in through ethical codes and good practice to how to operate well, well, then it will. You know, the logic of shaming and, and public virtue really matters. And I think a lot of big businesses can be a force for good, but the key is to key them into that good and to recognise and praise that good when it happens. So I think the sort of the notion of ethos-driven exchange applies right up and down the value chain at all levels. And I think something like that really could bring us a different future. And then there was one um, uh, final question, sorry, from the lady there. Hi, Chris Santhi from Social Enterprise magazine. Um, the ethos that you're talking about does exist in the social yeah. enterprise movement, um, but the social enterprise movement is very keen on things like introducing triple bottom line accounting, social return on investment, all these sort of practical steps that would really key it in. Because how do you know if a big business is being good if they're not reporting yeah. against triple bottom lines? What's your take on that? Well, I think you're right. Again, I think that what we need is a new matrix to assess what good behaviour is and what bad behaviour is. I think we need a much richer um, way to interrogate our tax system, to interrogate corporate behaviour, so that we truly do recognise and reward good behaviour and penalise bad. And I think that is very much part of the vision. OK, I'll, um, I'll bring uh, things to a close. I just would like to um, thank you all.